Good morning and welcome to our service. We're glad that you've decided to join us online this morning and now we just want to let you know what's going on at WBC this week. At noon later today, uh, we will have a kids video posted on our WBC Kids Facebook page and you'll be joining Becca for that video. And then on Monday at 7, please note the time change. At 7, we're going to be having young adults and if you'd like to be involved in that, you can contact Tiffany. Prayer meeting on Zoom will be on Wednesday at 6.30. It's on nine keys to a healthy relationship. So if you would like to join, please contact Pastor Craig and he will give you that information. And we have a building fundraiser going on. Uh, as you know, the building's going up on the hill and uh, we are selling mums. And so we have a variety of colors. We have red, yellow, orange, white, and a pinkish purple available available to you uh, 10 inch pots and they'll be picked up on september 11th and they are 15 dollars each and if you'd like to order some you can order online uh, call the church office or contact me mark your calendars rally day is coming up on september 13th we're really excited to get you see you guys once again and uh, more information will follow and today is a special day that we want to share with you um, just gotta get ready. Today is Pastor Craig's birthday, and we're really excited. Um, if you want to go by and honk at his house or give him a shout and let him know uh, that you are celebrating with him, we're not quite sure what year it is, but we are glad to be able to celebrate with him. So, happy birthday, Pastor Craig! <laughs> If you would like to get connected with us here at the church, please fill out our digital connection card. And there are multiple ways to give online as well. We hope you enjoy the service and uh, we just ask that you join in worship with us now. Good morning and we're so glad you're able to join us. Our call to worship this morning is found in Isaiah chapter 26, some very beautiful verses there. In verse seven, it says this, it says, the path of the righteous is level. You, the upright one, make the way of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. And so let's just unite our hearts together this morning. Father, we are so thankful that we have the opportunity to be able to gather in this way. Uh, Father, we're so thankful that um, uh, the most beautiful thing in all the world is to be able to walk in your way. And Lord, we certainly yearn for you. We long for you not only in the night, but also in the morning. And uh, we just long for you and we long for your way. And uh, Father, we we pray that your desire would be the desire of our hearts and so lord as we worship you this morning as we focus upon you in our word may you just uh, minister to us and father may our desire uh, be aligned with your desire in jesus name amen Good morning, Woodstock Baptist, Riverside Court, and Woodstock Community, and anyone else who's joining us online or from your kitchen or living room or wherever you're, you, you are this morning. It's a blessing to have you with us, and it's a pleasure to be gathered. Um, we're going to start this morning with Hosanna, Praises Rising. Let's sing together.
Today, Pastor Craig is going to be speaking on Psalm 37 verses 1 to 7. And right now, I'm going to read that for you. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Well, good morning, everyone. We do want to thank you once again for joining us online and being a part of this uh, sermon series entitled The Master Weaver. And so this morning, before we look into God's word um, and see all that he has for us this morning, I want to take just a moment and, and look to the Lord in prayer. So can we just unite our hearts together this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we're so thankful for um, the many blessings that you bestow upon our lives. And Lord, you are a good God. You're a holy God. Um, you are perfect in all your ways. And you're a God who who loves us. Um, you, you transform us. You change us. You remake us. You shape us. Um, you mold us. Uh, you are creating something beautiful um, out of each of our lives. And so, Lord, help us not to take your, your work for granted in our lives, but, Father, may we live our life in light of it. And may we today um, just choose to love you and to serve you and to respond um, to, to who you are and all that you've done for us in, in positive ways in which we would advance the kingdom of God. Uh, Father, we, we want to pray today for many from our congregation who are battling different health issues. We, we think today of Glenn Thornton, we think of Mark Martin, we think of Dorothy Jones, we think of Wally Anthony um, in hospital, um, and we just pray for them today that you would be pleased to continue to heal and strengthen them as only you can. We think today, too, of Bob and, and Burl Scott's daughter, Cheryl. We think of her as she recovers from a kidney transplant, and we just pray, Lord, for continued recovery. Uh, we pray that you just heal her body in every way. We pray today, too, for, for John Irvin as he recovers from surgery, and uh, we pray for your hand upon his life that this healing process and rehabilitation would would go well and so we we pray for him today and we commit him to you we think lord of others uh, we think of peter jones we think of mary somerville corey graham uh, we think of lexi seeley basil lawrence elton mckinley wayne rennie we think today too of rita sonier and marlene smith we just want to pray for each of these individuals uh, Father, may they know that we as a church family love them, uh, we are concerned about them, uh, we are praying for them, and uh, we just want to see you work and weave your uh, perfect will, Lord, into each of their lives. May they have a strong sense of your peace and presence today. And for us, Lord, um, we just pray that um, your spirit would move in our midst, that your spirit would 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 move in our hearts and in our lives. Um, Father, may you give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts that are tender and receptive to the truth of your word. So Lord, just, just move in us today as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we are gonna continue, as we've already stated, our series entitled The Master Weaver. And once again, this morning, we are looking at how God shapes us through the events of our lives. And this morning, uh, we wanna see how, how God weaves um, the thread of desire into our life. And God is creating something beautiful with your life. He's creating something beautiful with my life. And he just wants us to trust him in that process. In 1985, in September 1985, Reader's Digest ran a story titled Letter in the Wallet, and it was written by Arnold Fine. 
Arnold tells how one bitterly cold day he stumbled across a wallet on the street. It had just three dollars in it and a crumpled up letter that obviously had been carried around within the wallet for, for many years. The letter was dated 60 years earlier and began, Dear Michael, the beautifully written, sadly worded letter ended a romance because of a parent's demands. The last line promised, I will always love you, Michael, and was signed, Yours truly, Hannah. Arnold decided to try and track down the owner of the wallet. Using Hannah's address, still legible in the letter, he finally retrieved a phone number. But when he called it, he was disappointed, though not surprised, to learn that Hannah and her family had long ago moved out of the house. The person on the end, other end of the line, however, knew the name of the nursing home to which Hannah's mother had gone. So Arnold tried calling the nursing home and learned that Hannah's mother was no longer living. When he told them what he was trying to do, however, they gave him the address and the telephone number that they had on file for Hannah. He called the number and found out that at this point, Hannah herself now lived in a nursing home. And so Arnold asked for the name of the home and the phone number, and uh, soon he was of the nursing home where where Hannah was, and soon he was able uh, to track down the nursing home. He he wanted to be able to have a conversation with Hannah, and so he decided to visit this nursing home. And when he got there, the director met him at the door and told him that Hannah was watching TV on the third floor. An employee quickly took Arnold there and then left. And Arnold introduced himself to Hannah and explained how he had found a letter in a wallet. He showed her the letter and asked if she was the one who had written it. Yes, Hannah replied. I sent the letter to Michael because I was only 16 and my mother wouldn't let us see each other anymore. He was very handsome. Arnold could see both the twinkle in the eye and the joy on her face that spoke of her love for Michael. Yes, Michael Goldstein was his name. If you found him, if you find him, tell him that I think of him often and I never did marry anyone. No one ever matched up to him, she declared discreetly brushing tears from her eyes. Arnold thanked her for her time and he left. And as Arnold was leaving the home, the security guard at the door asked him about his visit and he, he told the security guard the story and he said, at least I was able to get the last name from her. His name is Michael Goldstein. Well, the, the security guard said, Goldstein? There's a Mike Goldstein that lives here in this, this nursing home on the eighth floor. And so Arnold turned around and went back inside, this time to the eighth floor where he asked for Michael Goldstein. When directed to the elderly gentleman, he asked the man when he first met him, he said, have you lost your wallet? Oh yes, I lost it when I went out for a walk in the city the other day, Michael answered. Arnold handled him the wallet and asked if it was his. Michael was delighted to see it again and full of gratitude uh, to, to Arnold for finding it. He thanked him profusely. And finally, Arnold interrupted him and said, I've got something to tell you. I read the letter in your wallet. Caught off guard, Michael paused for a moment and then said, you read the letter? Yes, sir, and I have further news for you. I think I know who Hannah is. Michael's face just kind of grew pale. You know where she is? How is she? She's fine, Arnold said, and she's just as pretty as when you knew her. Could you tell me where she is? I'd, I, 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 I'd love to call her, he said. You know, when that letter came to me, my life ended. I've never gotten married, and I never stopped loving her. Come with me, said Arnold. And he took Michael by the elbow and led him to the elevator and down to the third floor. By this time, the director of the building had rejoined them and they came to Hannah's room. Hannah, the director whispered, gesturing toward Michael. Do you know this man? She adjusted her glasses and looked at the man as she searched her memory bank. Then with a choked voice, Michael spoke up. Hannah, 
It's Michael. She stood as he walked over to her, and they embraced and they held on to each other for as long as they could stay on their feet. They sat down, holding hands, and between the tears, they filled in the story of the long years that had passed since they'd seen each other. Feeling as though they had intruded on a sacred moment, Arnold and the director slipped away to leave the two of them to enjoy their reunion. Three weeks later, Arnold Fine received an invitation to attend the wedding of Hannah, age 76, and Michael, age 78. Arnold closes his story by saying this. He says, how good the work of the Lord is. We read such a touching story. We hear such a touching story. And, and, it, and it makes us believe that that is a story that was made in heaven. Think about it. The sovereign handiwork of a sovereign, the handiwork of a sovereign God uh, leaves all of us moved to tears as we listen to a story like that and we see how God was weaving these threads. God weaved different threads together to create a beautiful story. When we hear a story like that, we not only see God at work, but we also see how desire was involved. Or shall we say how three determined wills were used to create a beautiful story. A man loved his girl so much that he stayed faithful to her and remained single his whole life because he couldn't love another woman the same way. A woman remained true to her first love. Uh, and faithful um, to him, even though she had been just a teenager, she committed um, her her uh, she committed to her her to honoring her parents' desire. A man resolved um, to return a wallet because he thought a heartbreaking little letter that was kept for sixty decades deserved a determined search for the owner. Desire is a strong but fragile part of life. And it has an impact on your life tapestry, uh, which is in process at the moment. You know, this whole idea of how God works and how God uses desire and how God uses will is, is very complex. Um, and it can be difficult to understand. You know, when we read or we hear about stories of the termination as people persevere through some very bitter struggles in life, we're moved to tears. But our hearts are also broken when we hear stories from others that tell us how how they quit um, too soon or they gave up as soon as things got a little bit tough. I don't have enough time this morning for us to grapple with with this whole thing uh, of, of the sovereignty of God and human responsibility and where these, these two uh, thoughts uh, from Scripture connect. But I do want us to talk this morning about desire. I do want us to talk about will. I want us to talk about the matter of will. God's desire, your desire, our desire, the desire of others. All of these threads are are, are weaved into the tapestry of life. The word desire means to long or to hope for. And perhaps we could use it interchangeably this morning with the will, because the will is used to express desire, choice, willingness, and consent. Uh, or perhaps it, it, in a negative connotation, it can be used to refer to refusal to do something. You know, we've all probably watched the television program, um, Extreme Makeover Home Edition. And if you haven't seen that show, um, it's where the whole home gets overhauled. It, the overhaul will include the interior, the exterior, the landscaping. And it's done in just seven days while the family is sent away on a vacation. And so sometimes these homes are completely demolished, they're completely gutted, um, and there's a complete renovation. The home gets completely re rebuilt, and there's this transformation that unfolds before our, our lives. And, and I can use that this morning of, of how that something that was broken and fallen down and dilapidated is turned into something absolutely beautiful. And 
And that's kind of the story of, of, of our decision to follow Christ. He, he takes us in our most unlovely state and he makes something absolutely beautiful from our lives. If you're a follower of Christ, if you have repented of your sin and embraced the finished work of Jesus on the cross, um, after all, Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again. We learned last week that that is of of utmost importance, of first importance, and, and that's what the gospel message is all about. And if we believe that and we receive the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart and into our life, um, he lives inside us and he lives lives inside us to bring about a renovation of the heart. He lives inside us to transform us, to change us. And as he comes into our lives, he, he, he brings about a change. Whereas prior to knowing him, we were living merely for self and for our own selfish desires. The very moment we receive Christ, we receive the Spirit of God. And all of a sudden, we no longer live for ourselves, but we begin to live for God. And we begin to want to follow him. And we begin to want to put his will and his way into practice within our lives. He moves us at the moment of salvation from heading down destructive paths to to putting us on a path to healing and and wholeness. He, He brings about delightful patterns into our life. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. He said, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The Christian desires to follow Christ. And one of the ways that we know we know him is if we have a desire uh, to follow him, if we have a desire to do the will of God, a desire to to be obedient to scriptures is not natural uh, uh, to to the natural man, but it is a part of of the life of, of the spiritual man or the spiritual woman, the one who has given their heart and their life to Christ. Paul provides us a comforting encouragement, reminding the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2 uh, that they aren't called to obey in their own power, but they're, they're, they're called to obey in the power of God working in us. Philippians chapter 2, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. The Holman Bible puts it this way, and I love it. It says, for it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. And so that word desire as used in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 carries with it the idea of to wish or to want. So so what God does as we become his child, as we become one of his followers, as we receive him into our life, is he puts within us a desire, a want to, a a longing uh, to work out God's good purpose for our life. D.A. Carson said this. He said, God is not merely working to, is not working merely to strengthen us in our willing and acting. Paul's language is stronger than that. God himself is working in us both to will and to act. He works in us at the level of our wills and at the level of our doing. But far from this being a disincentive to press on, Paul insists that this is an incentive uh, to, to continue on. Assured that we are, that God, assured as we are that God works in this way in his people, we should be all the more strongly resolved to will and to act in ways that please our master. Indeed, this is incentive. God is at work at the deepest levels. God is working in us uh, to bring our salvation to completion because uh, we, we work because God works. Paul said in Philippians chapter 15 and verse 10, but by God's grace, I am what I am and his grace toward me was not ineffective. However, I worked more than any of them, yet not I, but God's grace was with me. Paul says that that God is working in us for his good 
purpose. God fulfills his good purposes in us by his mighty power. This is so comforting. I'm not alone. As a Christian, you are not alone. God is at work in you and he is accomplishing his good purposes in and through you. So often in life we want to give up and we want to quit and we want to turn back, but but how do we how do we prevent that from happening? I think one of the the greatest blessings we have is knowing that that God is at work in us. Don't ever stop believing that God is at work in us. God is always at work. You see yesterday's victory does not guarantee today's or tomorrow's. But knowing that God is constantly at work in us makes a difference, not only in our today, but also in our tomorrow. It's paramount that we believe this and that we constantly be on guard against the enemy of our soul because he would do everything that he possibly can to cause us to doubt that God is at work in us to will and to do his good pleasure. In Psalm 37, which was read to us this morning, we're challenged to trust and not to fret. And so in the first section of Psalm chapter 37, David called for trust despite the presence of evil. He says, do not fret because of evil men. And so David instructed believers not to allow evil men who temporarily succeeded in their plans to become a, sea, to become a source of heated worry. He reminds us that that we shouldn't be envious uh, or or desirous of sinful people and their prosperity because they will wither like grass and they will soon die. Rather, what David says we should do is that we should trust in the Lord who can answer the prayers of the heart and the promise he will give and, and the promise that he will give us the desires of our heart. And, and it's based on just one condition that we're delighting ourselves in the Lord. You see, the one who delights himself or herself in the Lord has, has righteous desires. It's a person who's trusting in the Lord. And so delighting in the Lord, uh, delighting in God will give one righteous desires. And God will give the desires of the heart. David advised the righteous to commit their way to the Lord, which means to roll their way over to the Lord. God would make their righteousness shine like the dawn or cause their lives to radiate with the fullness of divine justice. God would vindicate the righteous in the future in his perfect timing, unlike the wicked who sought honor now. So the righteous, as David says here in this psalm, should be still before the Lord without taking matters into their own hands, and they should wait patiently for him. Do you need reminded this morning that God is at work in you? When when you delight in that truth, when you trust in him, he gives you the desires of your heart. Your desires will align with his desires. Your will will align with his will when we delight ourselves in the Lord. You see, all of this is a matter of choice, a matter of choice. In Joshua chapter 24, we have Joshua's farewell, and it was given to his people after they had crossed over the Jordan and came into con with seductive foreign gods. And Joshua reminded them all that God had done for them in past generations, how he guided them, how he directed them, how he guarded them, how he protected them and cared for them. And he protected them for 40 years of wandering, during which time they, they learned many bitter and painful lessons. And Joshua just gives to them this straightforward plea. He says, but if serving the Lord seems, and here comes a form of that word desire again, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served because beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua puts it to the people and he says, you've got a matter of choice here. There's a choice to make. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. The choice to serve is a matter of the will. It's a matter of desire. And the person who delights in God, 
his desires, her desires, will align with the desires of God. No one could make, could mistake that the choice of, of service um, to God lays in the hands of, of the people and God presented to them within the context of how he'd worked uh, in their lives in, in the past. God had made this decision that, that he would bless them. And so we need to we need to lay a hold of that promise that that God has his plans not to harm us but to prosper us. He has plans for our well being. He doesn't want us to struggle uh, without His voice or without His wisdom. God wants to bless you. He wants to bring you to the place of His choosing in your life. See, God could could easily use His sle- use a sledgehammer and enforce His will upon us. But with infinite patience, God works away in our lives, giving a sign after sign of his love. More often than not, unfortunately, it goes unnoticed by us or we, we just take it for granted. Jesus asked Paul in Acts chapter uh, 9, he says, why do you persecute me? And then he went on to say to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. And so in fact, he's saying to Paul in the New King James Version, you know, why are you bloodying yourself against the markers that God has placed along your way? Sometimes those of us who have been blessed the most seem to be the least capable of seeing God's hand on us. We would do well, as Jacob did, to put up stone markers to remind us of God's goodness to us in specific situations in our life. He said in in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 3, I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. This is a major step in making a choice to follow God. You know, the decision to follow God is is a matter of will. It's it's a matter of desire. It requires commitment to recognize that that, um, your mission in life isn't, isn't just about you. It's about a bigger picture. It's about your commitment to serve the Lord God all, Almighty. Um, and, and it requires a complete surrender to him. And so this thread is so important. It's easy for us in life to get sidetracked by secondary pursuits. Joshua reminds us that each of us must deliberately choose who we will serve. Susanna Wesley was a remarkable woman who gave birth to 19 children. One can only guess the inner strength she must have had to raise John and Charles, uh, two among many others who sat on her knee and learned from her walk with the Lord. And one day John asked her to define sin. And I doubt any theologian could have done it any better than she did. And she said, son, Whatever weakens your reasoning, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. In short, if anything increases the authority and the power of the flesh over the spirit, then that to you becomes sin, however good it is in itself. And that definition became a guiding light for John in his life. I think of another example. As a young man, David Livingston prayed, Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Sever any ties, but the tie that binds me to your service and to your heart. That prayer uh, became his watchword when God laid Africa on his heart. I think of that remarkable line, sever any ties, but the tie that binds me to your service and to your heart. What a mission statement for life to be bound to God's service and to his heart. Set the purpose, uh, that, that statement just sets God's purpose for our life clearly before us. And so it's a matter of choice, but it's a, also a matter of action. 
this, you know, when we look at Acts chapter 22, once again, focusing in on, on the life of Paul again, uh, Paul recounts God's working in his life and, and the Lord's descript, description of Paul's life mission. And while Paul is recuperating from his blindness, Ananias said to him, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth in Acts chapter 22 and verse 14. Paul has, has a, a clear encounter when he hears and he sees. He, he, we also see this, this definite instruction to Thomas to see, to touch, and hear the risen Lord. And after Thomas obeys Jesus' instruction and recognizes him for who he is, Jesus says to him, because you have seen me and because you have believed, blessed are those who have seen and, and yet have believed. In the same chapter, when Mary saw the risen Jesus. She literally wanted to hold on to him. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me. Go instead to my brothers and tell them. Again, in the same chapter, as Jesus bids his disciples farewell, he says to them to receive the Holy Spirit. In all of these instances, we know the presence of voice and direction. Uh, we, we do not always uh, you know, see, feel, and touch God. Uh, we do not, as a rule, uh, you know, he, um, hear his audible voice, but we hear God's ver voice for us in his written word, and that hearing must constantly be paired with, with the word do, um, you know, and combined with the will of God and the desire of God. Jesus speaks of seeking not his own will, but the will of the Father. And he says, if anyone chooses to do God's will in John chapter 7 and verse 17, uh, we we have a choice and and we have a choice to do the will of god god reveals his will um and 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 he reveals it to us in his will and if if we're obedient to god in in the areas that he has revealed to us in his word uh and if we're in in, in in obedience in those areas where his will is is clear and revealed, then I think God gives us great freedom um, to choose in other areas of our life. Um, and, and that's so important. Um, we often cry out to God, if, if only I knew the right choice here. And, and Paul gives us a clue in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. As a believer, he says, You, whoever, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. And if the Spirit of God lives in you, here's the thing. God's Spirit, if he's living inside you, will always lead you to do what is right. He will never lead you to sin. And those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what nature, uh, on, on that nature, what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires, writes Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. And then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, you know, we in a sense have a, the definition of a child of God where it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The gospel declares that the Holy Spirit brings about the new birth and that because of the Spirit's power within us, we gain the ability to do God's will. We have an opportunity to carry out the Lord's desires. So where does one begin? It's a matter of surrender. And I want to give to you the A, B, C, Ds of, of surrender. And, uh, and what it looks like to have a desire to walk with the Lord. And so first and foremost... Uh, we are to ask without pettiness. So we ask without pettiness. The Bible tells us to, to ask for the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11, um, Jesus responds to a request from his disciples to teach them to pray with what is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. And then he expands on the virtue of persevering in prayer. And he says in verse 9, he says, So I say to you, 
Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? So so ask for the Holy Spirit. As a, as a Christian, he lives inside you and he longs to lead us and he longs to guide us. He'll never lead us to do what's wrong, but always what is right. And he'll give us the power to carry out the will of God. And he'll enable us to surrender our own will and desire to the will of God. So there is ask without pettiness, but there's also being before doing. In a world that always wants to do, we hardly know what it is to be. But this is where that work of transformation comes in. He wants to work in us so that 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 we can we can be before doing. When someone asks you who you are, we invariably give the answer by giving our name. And uh, you know, that's why we always give our names in a relationship to somebody else. You know, in my name is my father's name, my my family name. Um, in my my passport is my my citizenship. Uh, who we are is always defined by whose we are first. Rabbi Zachariah said, "A Christian is really a Christ one." Um, my name is identified with his name. Who am I? I am a child of God related to my heavenly father. I am not my own. I belong to him. Resting in that um, knowledge, I know what it is to be his. I should pursue doing God's will then, and by his grace, he will enable my will. And so thirdly, the C here is conviction without compromise. And so a conviction is not merely an opinion. It is something rooted so deeply in the conscience that to change a conviction would be to change the very essence of who you are. The classic example here is is Joseph in the Old Testament. When Potiphar's wife repeatedly tempted him, he gave her the the pointed answer. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Notice he didn't say, what if we get caught? He didn't say, well, this is a really tough call. Any other answer could have left room for her to talk him into the affair. And so his response removed any possible enticement to rationalize and to give in to the temptation. And so there's conviction without compromise, but there's also discipline without drudgery. Hardly anyone likes the word discipline, but if one can only see the need for and the fruit of discipline, one can understand why it offers such great reward. Think of the athlete who disciplines his or her body to win the big race. Think of of the labor of love and the victory of reaping a harvest and sowing healthy seeds. Think of honoring God with everything you have and the peace that it brings. The Lord tells us that he disciplines those he loves. And by implication, then, the undisciplined life is an unloved life. You know, there's an old adage that says, when you sow a thought, you reap an act. When you sow an act, you reap conduct. And when you sow conduct, you reap character and you reap a destiny. When you sow conduct, you reap character, you reap a destiny. We can uh, each recall moments like this in our own lives. Moments when we realize that our response should have been different from what it was. G.K. Chesterton once said that there are many angles at which you can fall and only one angle at which you can stand straight. The next time you think about the power of desire, The next time you think about the power of your will, think not just of immediate choice, but of all the compromises to which one ill-advised choice could lead. And so purpose in your heart, desire in your heart to be led by the Spirit of God because He'll always lead you to do what is right. 
A little further in Psalm chapter 37 and verse 23, this is what it says. It says, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. In Psalm 37, 31, he continues, the law of their God is in their hearts. Their feet do not slip. What keeps us from misstepping? It's the revealed will of God. It's, it's the word of God. God's word puts us in the right lane in life. Pastor and author Erwin Lutzer said it this way. He said, obedience to reveal truth guarantees guidance in matters unrevealed. This morning, as you consider your life, may the thread of God's desire for your life be woven into the tapestry that he is creating. He's creating something beautiful in your life. Will your desire align with his? Father, we thank you this morning and we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be able to look at the thread of desire. Father, may uh, our will align with your will. May we be surrendered to you and may we be willing to be used by you and to recognize that true fulfillment in life comes from recognizing uh, the purpose that you've given us. Father, you've revealed your will for us in, in your word. And Lord, may, may we just surrender to it and recognize it as we're obedient to, to your word. You give us great freedom in other areas of our life. Father, uh, we're thankful that we could examine the thread of desire this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in online for our service this morning. If you want to get other ministry content, like our Facebook page and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you want to get connected online and join one of our online gatherings, please fill out a digital connection card. There will also be a link to give down below as well. We hope you are encouraged this morning and we hope that you have a great week.